So can I wait to see if we can get here from having to park far away? Yeah, I would. Because I had to park far away. Your chapter eight quiz is due tonight if you haven't already done it. Yep. Okay, good. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, chapter eight quiz is due tonight. Um, and then today we're going to talk a little bit about parenting styles, parenting techniques, and there is a matching specifically about that. It should be a really easy grade. And then there's a chapter nine matching quiz. So, of course, we're going to finish talking about chapter nine Thursday. But to make it. <laughs> okay. It's good for you to walk. It's okay. It's not raining. It's not snowing. There's no wind. Okay. So, parenting styles on page 246. Let's look at that for just a few minutes. So, the things that we look at are restrictiveness, for example. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Restrictiveness. Restrict. Yeah, I'm just going to put restrict. Um, demands for a child to... Achieve intellectual, emotional, and social maturity. That's a lot. Okay. So intellectual maturity, using all, all of their mental capabilities, right? Performing at their best level. Communication. And what's the last one? Right, warmth and involvement. All right, and so then what you have are you have um, the four different styles, authoritative. Okay, and what makes this bad is authoritative. I cannot spell today. There is only three letters difference in the first parenting style and the second parenting style. Okay, so be sure you notice that because it, it will trip you up on the authoritarian. It will trip you up on the matching. Okay, so one of the, the other two are permissive. and uninvolved. And what they do is they rate high and low. Okay, so if you look at the description for authoritative on page 246, the parents of the most competent children rate high in all four areas of behavior. 
Got that. So authoritative parents, they do place restrictions on their child. They do expect and help their child achieve intellectual, social, and emotional maturity. There's a lot of communication going on between the parents and the child. And there's also a high level of warmth and involvement. And this is the best. Okay. This is the kind of parent who are perceived as strict and they demand mature behavior. However, while they may be strict and have a high level of restrictiveness, they do reason with their children. Okay, um, the best example I can think of, if you contrast um, authoritarian, authoritarian, sorry, parents with authoritarian parents, because a parent who uses the authoritative method explains to their child why they have to sit in timeout. When timeout was initially created, you know, as a way to discipline children, they are supposed to spend one minute in the timeout chair for every year. So a two-year-old spends two minutes, a five-year-old five minutes. And they're not supposed to be able to get up from the chair when you're talking to them until they can tell you what they did wrong. Because they need to understand what they did wrong. And also until you talk about, you know, you can communicate about how to handle it differently. Okay, my kids are three years apart. My son would get angry, he was jealous, he was four, or you know, three to four, and he didn't know how to say, you're spending way too much time paying attention to that baby and not to me. So he got angry, and angry three-year-olds hit. Okay, I couldn't say to him when he was three, I know your whole life has been turned upside down by the arrival of a new baby but you need to handle your frustration better. Three-year-olds don't have that level of cognitive ability and language to understand that. So I told him, if you want to hit, you can hit the couch or you can hit your bed. Because he was going to hit something and I would rather it be the couch or the bed. You can't just say, don't be mad, because when people tell you to don't be mad, what does that do? <laughs> Makes you even madder. And you certainly can't say that to a three-year-old, all right? You can't say, you're just simply frustrated because you don't understand that the baby has to have more help than you do. You're talking to a three-year-old. So you still have to communicate, but you have to make sure it's on their cognitive and language level. Okay, so authoritarian parents use because I said so. There's never an explanation for the discipline. It's just discipline. And the example I use of this is, um, you know, older brother hits younger sister. And so then the parent is spanking him for hitting the sister. Okay, you're hitting him to punish him for hitting his sister. Does anybody see a problem on that besides me? I'm not saying physical punishment never works, but it's kind of like if I'm screaming at my children to stop screaming. You're not really using any sort of communication that's effective to help them understand what they're doing wrong and how to handle the situation different. Okay, so this is more authoritarian, is when parents use their size and their power as an authority as a parent, whereas authoritative is where they do have rules, but they explain why you have the rules. I don't want you to run into the road because I'm, you know, I want you to be safe. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, authoritative parents expect more, but they also offer more support. Okay. Authoritarian parents, um, guess what? How do you think their communication is? Right. It's low. 
Also, their level of warmth and involvement is often low. They're extremely strict, and as far as encouraging their children's um, emotional, social, and intellectual um, development, um, it's lower than this. I would say it's maybe a medium. They don't really rate it that way. It's, it's not high because they don't do it at the same level, but they do expect you socially to be appropriate because that's part of that restrictiveness. The problem is they don't ever explain to you what you did wrong or how to handle it better, okay? These children are the ones who often um, have a lot of troubles when they get, especially to like fifth and sixth grade, seventh grade, because now they start are starting to resent all authority. When people constantly tell you what to do, but they don't explain why, you come to resent them. And if they resent their parents, that's eventually going to turn into they don't respect any authority. So, some of you probably know people, or may have been told this yourself. One of the most difficult things as a school psychologist was when they would call me in because um, Bob hit Bill, so then Bill hit back. Because parents would tell their kids, if you get hit, I expect you to hit back. Defend yourself. Stand up for yourself. Well, there's a problem with that. Okay? If Cole hits me, he's going to get charged with assault as an adult. I can't hit a woman. <laughs> That's a good thing. But if I hit him back, guess what I'm going to get charged with as an adult? Assault. The reason you don't tell your children to hit someone back when they hit them is because you're trying to teach them how they're going to have to follow not only the rules in fourth grade, but also the laws as an adult. And no one's ever explained that to them before, so they don't get it. You know, if you want to tell your kid or if your parent used to tell you, if you get hit, then you need to hit back, then you've got to do it off school property. It's kind of like when parents say, well, you're 18 now, and I know you're going to drink, so if you're going to drink, I'm going to buy it, and I want you to have all your friends over here, and nobody can drive. Your parents just told you it's okay to break the law. So now you are diminishing your respect for authority. So now you don't understand that, you know, well, it was okay for my parents to provide my friends and I alcohol, so it's okay for me to drive 80 in a 55 zone. 17 year olds are not really good at distinguishing between which laws are okay to break and which ones aren't, if you give them permission to break some of them. So that's where this particular parenting style, authoritarian, can actually set them up for a lot of difficulties as an adult. These are the people who, you know, have no respect for the police, for example. Why does this matter? Well, <coughs> think about it. How does it impact people as an adult if they have these different issues as children? Furthermore, if you've got parents who, you know, don't encourage your intellectual maturity, then you may not reach your full potential. You're not going to do well in school. You're more likely to drop out. Okay, permissive parents, they don't really talk a whole lot about this, but permissive parents are um, very poor at communicating. They're typically very warm and involved However, when it comes to restrictiveness, they are like the lowest of the low because they let them do whatever they want. Now, when that happens, how mature do you think the child is actually going to be? I will never, ever forget like my first seated class 
during the day as a full-time instructor and the tables actually went this way and there was a student who always sat in the corner in the back and I was talking about this and she went oh my gosh and I'm like what you know I thought what's going on back there she said that's me when she was 16 her parents gave her a new car within a month she wrecked it what do you think they gave her another new car that she wrecked within six months she got another car not quite as nice and within you know not too long she got a speeding ticket that's when they finally bought her a beat-up clunker I'm just saying heck no why didn't they sit her down and, and she said this she said someone else actually said to me when are you gonna stop when you hurt yourself or kill someone else because in my opinion that's one of the worst things as a driver is not only do you have to keep yourself safe but if I decide to be reckless and do whatever I want because my parents never placed restrictions on me one of the worst burdens I think you can have is accidentally hurting someone else now if you're going 80 in a 55 zone that's you didn't intend to hurt someone but you certainly increased the likelihood of an accident so she it was someone else I don't know if it was a teacher or a friend who actually said you're so lucky you haven't killed yourself or someone else so they, these are also kind of what we sometimes <coughs> call princesses or my special snowflake you know because my special snowflake should be able to do whatever she or he want to do these are the students who say you gave me a bad grade on my project I don't my life would be so much easier if I could give grades I have 102 project ones to grade down from 168 if I could just give a grade it would be so much easier but students have to earn their grades I actually had an older man in one of my classes when I first started here Philip Morris had uh, closed or laid off a bunch of people so we had um, quite a few older students who you know as part of their um, layoff package they got to come back and take classes so they could learn new skills and he became very angry and said that he paid to take the class therefore he paid for the grade yeah I'd be willing to bet that he had very permissive parents who told him you know he should get whatever he deserves Unemployed parents. These are the ones who tend to leave their children on their own. They make few demands, so they're very low on restrictiveness. They do not encourage maturity. They don't really care if you pass at school or not. They also um, don't communicate and they have very low warmth and involvement. Obviously, uninvolved is the name. Okay, so you can see that, see kind of some of the differences in this. I don't know if that helps or not, but if you read on the next page, uh, 247, it kind of summarizes some of the things that we talked about. Authoritative parents are going to have children who do better in school. They're also going to have better self-esteem because you've explained things to them and because they're going to be more mature okay and um, versus for example someone who was raised in an authoritarian um, home because they're going to feel like they're never good enough so if i tell my three-year-old stop playing with your food stop playing with your food stop playing with your food at the table I'm actually just giving them attention so they keep playing with their food and then they end up spilling their food, plate of spaghetti on the floor and then I spank them but then I also spank them for running out on the road how do they know the difference in which one is actually dangerous behavior versus which one is actually annoying so they overuse punishment and so they don't have good um, self-esteem because they feel like they're, they're never going to be good enough 
And it doesn't really matter what they're going to do. You're going to be mad at them anyway, or they're going to get punished anyway. Okay. It also talks about um, impulsivity, moodiness, and aggression that is more likely in um, children who have um, permissive parents. Um, so it's kind of good to see this. Why does this matter as adults? <laughs> okay. So, if you're dating someone who had very uninvolved parents, okay, and they do not have good communication with their parents, how well do you think they're going to communi communicate with you, their significant other? Not very well. Ladies, be sure and see how he speaks to his mother. Does he have good communication with his mother? Now, if he doesn't, that doesn't mean that he's, you know, not going to be the right person. But it means that it's something that you may need to work on as a couple if you want to have a successful relationship. All right, guys. Watch and see how much she respects her father. Does she have communication with her father or mother? Unless there are extenuating circumstances, of course. But, you know, if you've got someone who doesn't communicate with their family, someone who doesn't have a lot of warmth or is completely distanced from their family as far as they don't talk, I don't ever want to have anything to do with them, I don't want them to come to the wedding, I don't want you to meet my parents, you ought to have a couple of yellow flags going up. Unless, like I said, there were extreme extenuating circumstances because not only does it mean that they do not have a good relationship with their parents it may mean they don't have the foundation to understand how to have a good relationship with someone else um, are you thinking of someone right now that falls into that category maybe possibly no makes no sense okay maybe a little bit one day, you're going to think back to this, and you're going to think, that's why they didn't work. I don't know what kind of parents they had. Maybe. Hopefully, it won't be you, because you already know that. Okay, so <laughs> let's flip back to page 237. See if I got this. This is also written out in words in the text books. Like, you want to take a picture? They can be. Okay, that's what I feel like my parents would be like, kind of just both things. That is the reason, if you remember when I talked about punishment, that's why punishment doesn't work as well as um, rewards and or reinforcement. <clears throat> Okay, so yes, you can have parents who's, you, right, you can have a father who's more this way and a mother who's more this way. But are you saying, can one parent be a little bit of both? Or did you mean two parents have different styles? Two, two parents with different styles, absolutely. And that's why punishment doesn't work as well. Because as a parent, even if I'm a single parent, Am I consistent day to day to day? No, I'm a human being. And even though I know I should use this, there are some days after I have explained 30 times why you need to pick up your dirty laundry, there's gonna come a day when I'm just gonna say, because I told you so, and I'm going to beat you if you don't do it. You don't really say that, obviously, because you're human and you're not always consistent. So then when you add two people and they have two different styles, then you're probably going to have a child who um, communicates and talks to, and as they get older, they're going to go to the parent that it has more warmth and communicates better. They're probably going to have a better relationship with that one. And you're probably going to try, you're probably eventually going to avoid telling, if you have one of these, you're going to avoid telling them the things you did wrong or when you got in trouble or what your grades are. Or you're going to, you and the other parent are going to say, well, she's going over to Sue's for a sleepover when actually you're going out with a boy, but you don't want the dad to know that. Mm-hmm. So what happens is then you have good communication with one parent, but as a family unit, you're starting to break down your communication. 
<laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, how'd you know? <laughs> because this is based on research. It's very true. Um, very true. And then you have to throw in the culture differences. And what if you have one parent who was raised by a single parent, or a, both parents used this, but then the other parent was in a home where this was more the case. It also depends on what was modeled for them when they were growing up. My dad's parents were not real involved, but that was because he was the next to youngest of 11, and he felt like he had five mamas because he had five older sisters. You know, so he had more than that, but he had five who still lived in the home. So he he did not have, I mean, his mother never disciplined him. His other <laughs> sisters did it. And did that affect how he disciplined us? Absolutely. And my brothers were definitely disciplined much differently than I was as a girl. Because that, there was a cultural difference in that. And those expectations. So just something to think about. Now, this doesn't mean that if you grew up in a home, for example, where most of it was low, that you're doomed. It means that now you're educated and you see that. And so now you can do what you need to do to change that as when you become a parent. Or now that you know that maybe you do have a little bit more difficulty communicating, you can work on it. That's the reason you have to take these general ed classes. Not because you hate them and because we want to torture you and teach you stuff that isn't meaningful. But now that you know, you can change that. Right? You can make the world a better place. Rainbows and puppy dogs and peanut butter M&Ms, right? All because you took psychology. Mm -hmm. Sleep. Okay, so Piaget, it's not Piget, as some people want to say. Piaget was a Swiss um, psychologist. He lived in France a good part of his life. But he is the first one to say that we need to look at the different levels of cognitive development in children. Okay, we know that children develop differently physically. We know that they almost double um, their body size in the first year, for example. We know that teenagers go through puberty, right? We know about the physical changes. But he was one of the first ones to say, we need to look at cognitive development. Because when he was introducing his theory, there were still some people that were of the opinion that children should be raised as little adults. You know, it's kind of like you envision in Europe when the nannies are taking the children to the park and they're dressed just like adults and they're supposed to walk just like adults and they're supposed to walk through the park instead of climbing and screaming and running and playing because they were treated like miniature adults. And if I as an adult could sit through a lecture for two hours, then it was expected that these miniature adults could do the same thing. And he was one of the first ones to say, mm, we need to look at cognitive development because it just doesn't go that way. Seems kind of obvious, but not so much. So how does the education system decide when you should teach algebra? Because of the cognitive development theory that started with Piaget. Some people who go into education are still required to write their lesson plans according to Piaget's theory. So, if you're going into education, you want to be sure you pay attention to this. Okay, so if I have a, an eight month old in their high chair at my house and we have a miniature poodle, okay? And my eight-month-old has learned to say, that's a dog. Dog. Because we've said it 14 times a day. And that dog is always at the bottom of the high chair because it wants the food that the baby is going to inevitably drop, right? Right. Okay. So, then I go to someone's house and they have a great game. 
and we tell that eight month old that that is a dog. <laughs> and that eight month old looks at us like, hmm, sorry, you're wrong. Because miniature poodle inside my house versus Great Dane that's this big off the floor, those are not the same thing. They can't both be dog. So they have to learn to assimilate the new information. This is on page 237. Assimilate the new information. So now they learn that dogs can be different sizes and they bark and they have a tail and they have legs. They, may not, they probably can't count four yet, right? But authority, my authority figure said it's a dog. So now I've got to assimilate this new information that the Great Dane is also a dog. And so then we're driving home and I'm riding in my car seat and I look out the window and I say dog because there's a dog standing in a pasture in the fence. And a grown up says, no, that's a cow. And now it's really confusing because the cow looks about the same size as the Great Dane from a car and it has legs and it has a tail and it has a head, but you're telling me it's a different animal. So now what they have to do is they have to start figuring out a way to accommodate all this information. And there's a certain point where cognitively they'll start to understand that these are all animals. Because then you take them to a farm and they see a horse. And then you take them to the zoo and they see a zebra. Okay, now stop and think about it from a perspective of an eight month old. If you take a picture of each of those and you put them in a book, they all look pretty much the same because there's not gonna be a lot of size difference if their pictures are in a book. So now they have to accommodate all this information and start making new schemas. And remember when we talked about hierarchies, how you kind of put all the different information into a hierarchy so you can sort it. So eventually they're gonna learn these are all animals. And as they get a little bit older, maybe by the time they're three, they're gonna realize that dogs are pets these are farm animals and these are zoo animals. That's why there are always different books for farm animals and different books for zoo animals because you're trying to help them figure out how to sort and assimilate this new information that they're taking in. Because it really can be kind of confusing when you look at that, right? Stop and think about dogs. My daughter and I volunteer at the Humane Society twice a week. Well, I usually go once a week, she goes twice a week. And the assortment of dogs that they have in that place is mind blowing. I mean, everything from, you know, little bitty ones to big ones to medium sized ones. They've got one that's got three legs. They've got one that's missing an ear. And you try and you realize they're all dogs. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it. And some of them are friendly and some of them are not so friendly. Okay, you're not three, but you can kind of see how that could be confusing. It's kind of like I was telling you earlier in the semester, I didn't make this up, that if you can tie new information and new concepts that you're learning in your classes now with the information that you already know, you will better be able to accommodate that information in your knowledge. Okay. And that's one reason we make you take all these general ed classes, is so you can kind of have a broader view of the world, but also so you can figure out what you're really interested in. Okay, so then Piaget talks about the different stages of development. Sensory motor. So Sue in her high chair, eight months old. Where does everything go? In the mouth, right? When they're crawling in the mouth. Doesn't matter if you just vacuumed. If there is a single piece of something on the floor or in the carpet, they're going to find it. And they're going to put it in their mouth. That's because they are at the stage where they learn everything through their senses and through their motor skills. Oh my gosh, I see something on the carpet. I'm going to crawl over to it and I'm going to use my senses to put it in my mouth so I can see how it feels and how it tastes and I may not realize that I'm actually also putting it to my nose. 
okay? So they begin to distinguish between different smells, different tastes, different textures in the touch and how it looks differently, okay? But all of that is learned through their senses and their motor skills. So put me back in my high chair. Don't ever put the bowl of Cheerios with the milk on the tray, never because it will end up in the floor. Okay, so you give them a few Cheerios and a spoon because they want to feed themselves, okay? But you just put a few Cheerios on there and they start dropping the Cheerios off. And why are they doing that besides to feed the dog? Because they're listening to see if it makes a sound when it hits the floor. They're using their motor skills to pick it up, move my arm, drop it. That's a lot of motor skills for an eight month old. And they realize, I didn't hear it hit the floor. And then they try the spoon and they realize it makes a noise. And that's why they drop them 15,000 times because they want, to, they want to learn the difference in how they sound and how they feel and how they taste. This spoon makes a lot of noise, but it, it doesn't taste like anything. Cheerios don't make any noise, but they're my favorite to eat. That's how they're exploring their world. So you have to be very careful because you want them to learn a lot of things, but you don't want them to put everything in their mouth. And so that's one of the first stages of cognitive development, according to Piaget. And then we get to pre-operational. This is where you start using words and symbols and understanding that there's a relationship between objects. So my mom, sits me down and I look at a picture book and I see dog and I come to realize that that picture of dog is a symbol for the same thing as that little miniature poodle running around in my house. It also is a symbol of the dog, the Great Dane at grandparents' house. Okay, so they start putting together those symbols and the words and the actual dog for example. And they're also very egocentric. What are the two most favorite words of two-year-olds? No. no and mine. Because the whole world is about me. So if I ask a four-year-old if Bob is standing in the parking lot and looking this way, what will Bob see? What will Bob see if he's in the parking lot? He's looking this way. See a building. He'll see windows. He'll see doors. Bob, if it, or the kid inside, is not going to be able to understand that. And they're going to say, well, when I look out the window, when he looks out the window, he'll see trees in the sky. They cannot take someone else's perspective. So when I reach over here and I grab her baby doll, because it's mine, Okay, I have no understanding of the fact that she is now screaming because I took away her toy. All I know is I'm happy because it's all about me and now I have the toy. I don't get it. I can't look at the world from her perspective because I don't have the cognitive ability to do that. So when you have 15 children, 15 two-year-olds in a classroom, you have 15 dolls and 15 trucks because they do not have the cognitive ability to understand the word share. Or you made her sad when you took her baby. Well, it doesn't matter because it's all mine. And when you try to take it from me, I'm gonna say no, because those are the words I know. No and mine. And that's to be expected. So yes, you can still demonstrate how to share, so hopefully they can observe it and learn it but just don't really expect it to really click until they're about five years old. It's also kind of like this poor little kid in the picture who was excited and wanted to touch the blue gorilla. And then they put um, that piece of cardboard in between the gorilla and the baby. Object permanence. When they don't see it, it doesn't exist, okay? If you're a parent, this is going to make you kind of sad. But when you leave your five-month-old at daycare, they don't miss you because they don't remember you because you no longer exist because they can't see you. 
They're, they may realize that the person that's holding them now doesn't smell the same, doesn't um, uh, feel the same, you know, maybe um, if they're getting a bottle instead of being nursed, they realize it doesn't taste the same, but they don't actually yet have this image in their head, mom. So that's why you always, always, always take a pacifier away before eight to 12 months, because once they remember that it exists, even when they don't see it, there's no getting rid of it. And they'll wake you up in the middle of the night when it falls out of the crib and they wake up and they want it. They don't know what they want at five months, for example, but they know they want to suck because that sues them and they don't have anything to suck on. But once they name it around 10, 12 months, it's going to be much harder to get rid of it. Okay. Now, this is one of my favorites, conservation. This is also something they haven't developed yet. Okay, until they're about five years old. Ever been at a birthday party and you like, you know, they all have their little plates and you put a few chips, you got the big bag and you put some on there and they start screaming because somebody else got more than they did? Yes. That's because they don't understand that it's the same. That's why you buy the little packs of potato chips and give everybody their own pack and you give everybody a juice box. Because if you take two bottles of water, they can tell you that that's the same. But then when they actually watch you pour one of them into a taller glass, and you say, which one has more, less, or are they the same? They're going to say this one has more because it's taller. They're not going to say taller because they don't know that word yet, typically at four. But they're going to say this one has more. And then they're actually going to watch you pour it back into this one. And they're going to say, oh, now they have the same. And then if you pour one of them into a flat bowl and you say now, they're going to say this one has less and this one has more because they don't get it. They don't get that when you change what size glass it is, it's still the same amount of water even though they washed you. In Stanley County Schools on Fridays, they always used to serve, I don't know if they still do, a rectangular piece of pizza. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you have bad memories. Okay, and so I was substituting, and the pre-K was over here, and my kindergartners were sitting down over here. Well, the pre-K, they cut their piece of pizza in half, so they had two pieces of pizza. And Bob, in my class in kindergarten, is getting ready to have a meltdown because it is not fair that a four-year-old has two pieces of pizza and he has one. And I said, they just cut his in half because his hands are smaller because he's four and you're a big boy, so you get to have the whole big piece. Did he get it? No. no. So I, took it, I said, oh, wait, I'll go get you two pieces. And I went, and I turned around with my back to him, and I took a knife, and I cut it in half, and I gave it back to him. And he had two pieces of pizza. Same piece of pizza. But because he hasn't developed cognitively well enough to understand conservation, he doesn't get it. Why does this matter? Because when you're trying to teach an eight-month-old or a two-year-old how to share, they're not cognitively ready. When you're trying to teach a 13-year-old how to make good decisions and understand the consequences of their own behavior, it ain't going to work. So it's really important to understand what level of reasoning they're at. Okay, and then they talk about concrete, which is elementary school age where you have teddy bears for blocks to count. Two plus three. Okay, so by the time, if you're in concrete uh, operational stage of development cognitively, you can't do that unless you have something to count because it has to be concrete. So you gotta draw the little apples or draw the little circles or give them blocks or whatever to count. But then as they develop into um, the next stage, they're able to think more abstractly. They can do it without having something to actually count. Does everybody go through this development at the same stage? 
you know, I know some adults who still don't understand the consequences of their behavior. Okay, so, but how many fourth graders want teddy bears or blocks in front of them to count? No, that's not cool, right? So, when I was substituting for an EC teacher one time, she used a touch map. So, the students had to learn that everywhere there's a point, you put a dot. So, now, if I'm still a concrete thinker, I can go one, two, three, four, five. I know the answer is five. And if I want to check it, one, two, three, four, five. I don't remember exactly how they did that dot. They can count the dots. And you practice that enough with them that then they don't even have to put the dots on there. They just count them, even though they're not on there. Because there's a way that they can touch it and feel it and make it seem real. Have you ever seen people doing like this on their cheeks when they're doing math? They're feeling the dots or people who are doing it like this because they don't want people to see them counting on their fingers. That's because maybe math is not their best area. That's not where their strengths lie, so they've learned a different way to do it. They still need that concrete example when they're doing math, but they don't really, you know, you don't really want to use teddy bears and blocks when you're trying to figure out how much four tires are going to cost. <laughs> so I have calculators and all stuff. Okay, so um, finish reading the chapter. <clears throat> oh, don't forget to take your chapter 8 quiz by tonight. And be excited about talking about early adulthood development. Because that's you. 